All right. So uh, welcome, everyone. Thanks for coming. Um, you heard about RISC-V this morning uh, from Yensup. And um, so I'm going to talk about the uh, RISC-V port, architecture port, actually, on Open Embedded. So where we are, uh, what we've done, and uh, you know, where we are going, and what are things that are still pending. So uh, pretty much uh, introduction, a little bit on both projects and uh, what works. I'll try to give a demo uh, if it works. Um, and uh, then what we are working on right now and uh, what are some of the items for future. So um, this five is uh, free um, ISA um, that uh, started in Berkeley. Um, there are others like Open Risk and uh, uh, MIPS and all, but uh, RISC V started off as a clean slate, um, and uh, it's not called RISC V or something. It's called RISC V. Um, genealogy goes from RISC one, two, three, four. Likewise, this is RISC V, um, and it's licensed under a BSD license, um, and started in 2010. So there were other architectures. Uh, that were available at the time, but uh, they were lacking in few things. Um, uh, and they were also um, copyrights and other stuff um, that were uh, causing issues back then. So uh, this started as a clean slate in 2010. Um, so by now, there is a foundation, RISC V Foundation, um, that manages the activities around development and you know, the, um, the ISA and uh, specs uh, around RISC-V. Um, they also have a GitHub handle. Um, you are welcome to go there. They have several projects. And they see a lot of projects there that are being ported to RISC-V. Um, and then eventually they make upstream. And um, you know, they still manage them. Uh, for a while, but eventually, uh, once they are upstreamed, then you see a less and less activity on these projects, more and more activity upstream. Um, there are several commercial adopters for RISC-V right now. Um, it's uh, still in very early stages, but um, uh, you've heard of low-fi boards, high-fi boards. So there are boards that are coming out which are based off of RISC-V. Um, Yocto and Open Embedded, so it's actually an infrastructure to create own distributions. It's not uh, one of the given distributions that you might know. Uh, you know, like uh, we have Fedora, Debian, and others. They are um, distribution with policies and things. Um, whereas Yocto project along uses Open Embedded technology to provide that feature uh, for you to be able to generate your own embedded Linux distribution. Um, and Yocto project actually is not a single project. Uh, there are several projects underneath it um, with a motive to improve embedded Linux development experience. Um, so they are contributing to several other projects under the same umbrella. It uses open embedded build system, as I said, and uh, they enhance it, um, improve it, add new features to it. Um, open embedded gives you a lot of flexibility at the cost of some learning curve. Um, and, um, but this is required in embedded systems. Many times you want a possibility for you to customize things. Um, the beauty of this is that it gives you a horizontal scale. You have the same infrastructure that can scale from a very small um, you know, a system to a very large system, um, large in the sense of packages and, and features that you want to put on the box. So um, right now, it provides development environment, workflow tools. Uh, test is big 
so you can run auto tests, for example. There is a lot of work happening in this area. Um, and uh, SDKs is another uh, stellar feature, uh, which we, you can distribute your SDKs to others to let them do development on top of um, what you would have put together as a platform. Um, layered architecture is actually very powerful because many a times you have these monolithic systems where you might be needing only a handful of uh, packages, but you end up you know, with a big blob of thousands of packages. Even if you don't want them, you have no big choice. Um, and in many cases, it's fine if they don't interfere with your work, but most of the time, that's not the case. Um, with layered architecture, um, we can actually leave out certain pieces that we don't need. And you can add specific pieces that, that you need uh, into your projects. So that gives you more targeted packages and leaves out a lot of unused code for you. So bringing all this power of Open Embedded to a new architecture like RISC-5 is fun. So we're going to go into that and just uh, talk about that today. So feel free to ask questions or comments, anything you have in between. And we'll take it there. So um, what we've done, we talked about layers. So we created a layer. Uh, it's called uh, MetaRISC-5. Uh, this is actually architecture layer. Right now, it has uh, emulator machine. And uh, there might be f more reference boards added in future, but right now, it only has an emulator uh, for a machine. And uh, it has additional packages that you, would, you have to kind of uh, either fix or tweak um, to get it working on RISC-5. And uh, if you go there, look into the layer, there aren't very many left anymore. Um, and uh, we'll talk about that as we move. Uh, six months ago, uh, it was not so, so uh, the case. Um, so the setup is, uh, this is a minimal setup I've uh, mentioned here. Uh, it only depends upon the core layer so you just check out the core layer and then check out the RISC-5 layer and then you know, set up your environment and you're all set. Um, after you have uh, uh, set it up, um, you select the machine to be Kimu RISC V64 and uh, off you go. You can build, uh, you can start your build. So it's uh, just these three steps. Um, there is only 64-bit QME right now. 32-bit is not yet supported. There are um, some gaps there. For example, glibc doesn't work yet. Uh, so there are portions missing uh, as far as 32-bit port is considered. Um, so while you're building for first time, the build might take a little longer. Uh, so I just uh, mentioned that here. So um, you can have your lunch. Coffee will not be enough. Um, and uh, once you have the image built successfully, uh, you can do both uh, user level, user mode networking as well as uh, normal uh, tap based networking. Both of them work. Um, so uh, Open Embedded provides infrastructure to run QMU. Um, and all those um, options that you are required to supply are actually very nicely abstracted underneath these tools uh, called Run QMU. Um, and it runs in the same environment where you build it. It uses that environment to, to extract out information about your architecture, your machine, and, and then uses that information to search for images um, in your deploy area and then run it. So essentially from user perspective, if you uh, just run this command um, with no graphic, which means you want a console uh, only image, um, and then it comes up with the uh, images. So you don't have to worry about all the options you need to pass. 
Um, yet, you could modify it if you want to. So um, all those are actually parameterized in, um, in, in the machine configuration file. So you can change values if you want. For example, the default memory is 256 meg. So if you want to make it 2 gig or something, you can go in the machine.config and, and change that uh, to whatever value you would like to have. So if you're running in, uh, in user mode, um, you know, the port 22 is forwarded to, uh, to, 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 to on your build host, and you can do uh, local SSH using that. Or if you use the normal tab-based um, um, networking, you can directly SSH into it using a specific address, uh, 192.168.7.2. We'll talk about that uh, a, a bit later. So porting status. Um, so right now, if you build it, these are the uh, uh, key components that I've listed here um, and then listed their status. Kernel, actually, we are, I'm building the, from Linux Risk V port, but actually the support is all upstream. So um, I haven't yet tried 4.16 RC4. Um, but it should be buildable. So uh, 4.15 is when uh, the support was upstreamed. Uh, glibc is all upstream, and in Open Embedded, uh, we are using glibc 227, so uh, we carry no patches. It's just using it from Open Embedded core. GCC, same way it is. Uh, there are no patches. It's in the core. Binital, same way. GDB, um, well, this is a uh, um, uh, little obsolete information here, but uh, yesterday it was accepted upstream, so um, this slide is a little obsolete. Um, and so it's still using RISC-V vinyls. Um, QMU is, again, uh, it's using RISC-V QMU, but uh, QMU support also got accepted last week uh, upstream. So the next release of QMU will have RISC-V support out of box. So um, as you can see, the tools, major tools I mentioned, two of them are already upstream. So basically, everything that's on that slide is upstream, except the RISC-5 tools. Um, and these tools are essentially, we'll mention more about those. But uh, uh, these tools help to launch uh, the kernel. So you can think of them as you know, BSP tools, like bootloader tools. Um, So what works? Um, so there are several reference images in, um, in core. And um, so most of the command line or most of the non-graphic images, they are buildable and they, they run. Um, so core image minimal is very small, just uh, you know, uh, console utilities and, and library. Uh, then you have the base image, which has a lot more uh, like networking stack and things like that. And then there's core image full CMD line, which is essentially a full kind of serverish image. Um, and on top of that, the SDK's equivalents of those work too. Um, so you could generate an SDK for any of these three images. You can generate an extensible SDK uh, out of these images. So if you are a open embedded Yakta developer, you probably know that extensible SDK is uh, um, is new feature in in open embedded where you ship uh, the open embedded build environment as SDK, um, and it's very powerful. It's ex ex extensible because generally SDKs are pretty static. You give your SDK, and suddenly there's a dependency somebody needs, and so either you regenerate the SDK or you have to create that dependency in your package. Um, extensible SDK kind of helps you there because you can just add that dependency right there and extend your SDK. Um, so it's very powerful from that aspect. Um, so um, init systems. Uh, so we have three init systems in uh, Open Embedded. All three work. 
um, Sys5 init, and uh, systemd and busybox. Uh, all of those you can pick and choose, and uh, they all work with, uh, uh, with RISC-5. Um, As I mentioned before, uh, you could use uh, networking. You can uh, run QMU and uh, both um, user mode as well as tap, both of them work fine. Uh, so a little bit of booting in QMU. So uh, the kernel, so the way this five boots up, they have something called proxy kernel. And uh, what it does is it bundles a Berkeley bootloader, BBL, as kernel as a payload into that bootloader. So what you will see is um, when we run QMU, uh, we give BBL as our command line to the kernel, or we call BBL as our kernel command line to um, QMU. Uh, the reason for that is that uh, the proxy kernel basically uh, provides that as a payload to BBL. Um, so I've provided a link if you are interested to dig further um, into the risc 5 pk recipe, how it is uh, uh, grabbing the kernel after it's deployed, and then generating a BBL, which is basically your bootable kernel um, in, in KMU. Um, and the root FS is normal, normal root FS that you generally have uh, for other QME images, um, it's exactly the same. There is nothing spe special about that. So when you boot, so this is a couple of screenshots I've attached. They are very uh, blurry. Um, but um, I can probably show you uh, So uh, here you can see it's, it's booted right now. So if you just launch it uh, with uh, no graphics, that's what those um, screenshots were showing you. And um, it's, it's uh, launching the VBL logo at the very beginning. And then you get to see the login screen. And uh, you might have observed that there are two login screens. It's a, uh, it's a bug in the serial driver. Uh, that is, that's in kind of interfering with, um, with early print K. So that's a known problem. So we talked about SDKs. So I thought that I actually generated an SDK and I've installed it. So while it's working, I'll just show you that. And um, so it's installed here and I've set up the environment. So if you see, uh, you can see that right now it's uh, actually um, showing the CC variables and all those from the uh, generated SDK. And then I have uh, a little uh, script here, which basically builds a hello world and then transfers it over to the emulator. And then we'll see whether it runs. So it just copied it over. And let's see if it is there. So we can see it. And so that basically gives you a full uh, cross build environment where you can build your apps in a cross environment using the SDK and then uh, transfer it over S to, to emulator and, and do your work, um, build it over there. So um, now I'm going to move on to some of the work in progress. In other words, what currently doesn't work and is uh, being worked on. Um, so what we currently have is, um, as I mentioned earlier, graphics. Um, it doesn't work. And as you can see, uh, when you build one of the graphical images, um, it ends up uh, in, in building GStreamer. And then GStreamer actually throws this error at you, could not detect architecture. 
uh, don't know whether it supports unaligned, unaligned access, please file a bug. So clearly there is uh, some work to be done in this area. Um, we haven't yet uh, delved deep into this. Uh, so we did some patches. Um, there is a potential issue in, in GCC as well, um, where when you enable pthread option, then there is an internal define called minus reentrant, which seems to be missing. Um, this becomes a big deal when you have other tools trying to detect threading support, and uh, they use this, this um, variable, um, this define, rather, to validate whether you know, threading support is working on a given tool chain and architecture. And without this, it just comes out uh, to be not supporting threading. So, um, so I think uh, there, there was some discussion on the is 5 mailing list on that, but uh, there hasn't been much traction um, whether you know, we need to fix it or not. So probably um, we need to delve more into it as we move. So uh, LTTNG, um, again, um, you know, when we build this uh, development images and larger images, LTTNG uh, and other profiling packages, they get included. And uh, currently LTTNG fails to build, uh, cannot build un unrecognized architecture detected. Um, so um, I hope that doesn't remain the case for long. And uh, the GCC sanitizers, they don't yet build. Um, and so that's also work in progress. Probably uh, we will have some, some support that in GCC 8.0. So um, in open embedded, uh, auto testing doesn't yet work. Um, there seems to be some issues with how it connects to emulator. And um, um, it seems to be that there might be some misunderstanding between how the RISC V emulator is showing the consoles um, to the um, KME testing framework that's in open embedded. Um, so I've included here if you know, any of you are interested in trying it out and uh, fixing it, sending patches, then this is how you could basically enable your test image and then you can reproduce the problem. Um, this is actually very helpful if we get that fixed because then it enables a lot of testing, uh, runtime testing for the packages on emulator. So uh, you know, a lot of bugs can be uh, can be found and, and fixed once we get this going. So um, we've supported, um, actually all the support that is needed in core layer is actually um, submitted upstream, uh, all the patches. Some of them are already uh, applied, some of them are in flight right now. And uh, hoping that by 2.5 release or Yocto um, in April 2018. We might have all the core pieces that are required to build RISC-5. Um, and obviously, you need to have the BSP layers, which is uh, uh, meta RISC-5 for now, and then maybe further board-specific layers as they develop. So um, cross prelink. We use cross prelink uh, not only to, to support accelerated loading, that's one feature of cross prelink, but we also use it to um, to help us detect some library dependencies during cross builds because LDD cannot be used. So, um, so we use prelink's RTLD um, tool to to do that detection. And uh, currently, uh, what that means is we uh, prelink has to understand RISC V uh, architecture as a machine. Um, for it to work, even in cross environment. So, um, but there's a patch. Um, the porting patch is already submitted upstream for cross link, cross pre link to be included. Um, then, Lib Atomic Ops uh, support is actually upstreamed already. Uh, we don't have yet a release uh, of Lib Atomic Ops. 
um, that is being used in open barrel. So we are actually carrying patches for live atomic ops in Metal Risk 5. Uh, whenever the next release happens and open embedded upgrades to that release, we will basically uh, be able to throw away these patches and, and then just move to the upstream releases. Um, on the same lines, there are a few more libraries which are carrying RISC V support patches. Um, LibFFI, NSPR, LibGPG are, so these, those are few of, uh, few actually probably the only ones which are currently left as far as OE core is uh, um, concerned. Um, the good thing is they are carrying the local patches which are already submitted upstream. And I'm hoping that uh, they will get included in the future releases of these packages as well. So um, some of the future things uh, for uh, the architecture uh, in Open Embedded, uh, if you want to make it core architecture, there are things that are missing. Uh, for example, GDB, uh, well, it is upstream now, but uh, uh, likewise, uh, muscle support, you know, there are patches already available. They are being considered for the next a release of muscle. Hopefully, we'll be able to get them uh, upstreamed into muscle uh, next release. Uh, Golang support, um, it is a core infrastructure in Open Embedded, so um, we would basically require Golang to work as well. Um, and uh, we need the QME support upstream uh, as well, uh, which is already accepted upstream, so hopefully the next release of QMU uh, we'll have, um, you know, the needed support for RISC-V uh, in upstream as well. Um, so uh, there is a hackathon going on today, and uh, uh, they are actually um, working on the, the Sci-Fi Freedom uh, U540 SOC based board. And uh, the plan there is that we would like to have open embedded support that BSP uh, as uh, one of the first, you know, real boards um, to be supported on open embedded. So um, hopefully, you know, in the hackathon, some, some of this will come out and probably we'll have a few patches um, done for supporting that platform uh, directly using open embedded. 32-bit um, RISC-V, uh, I talked about it. We need 32-bit glibc support. Um, and um, I guess other, uh, other major tools like GCC and everything, they do have 32-bit uh, support already in there. So probably once we have 32-bit support in glibc and muscle, maybe either of those or both of them, even better, then um, we will be able to support 32-bit uh, user space as well, uh, along with this one. So, um, so here are a few uh, RISC V resources. Uh, if you are interested to work um, on RISC V, uh, they, there is an IRC channel which is pretty active on free node. So hop on, free, feel free to hop onto that and ask questions if you have any. Um, and uh, there are several uh, repositories on GitHub on risks we handle are, uh, that are very interesting. And uh, if you are interested in contributing to some of those, um, then you, know, you are welcome. And there are mailing lists. Uh, they are not very high volume right now. Um, but one of them would be interesting is the SW Dev. For example, that you know, a lot of uh, software issues are being discussed and, and uh, questions and answers. Um, so it's, it's in very early stages. It's a time where you can make contribution to um, you know, the, the ecosystem, how they define the uh, various uh, building blocks. So it's, it's a very good time if you want to influence that uh, to, to go there and participate in, in those discussions. Um, about you know various things like how directory structure should look like or um, other pieces you know how the multi lib should work or should it work at all 
and uh, those kind of questions are being discussed. Um, if you are interested in Yakto project um, resources, finding out more about it, and I've listed a few links here to the Git repositories for um, Open Embedded and Yakto project, and um, also link to the main website. So there's a new, uh, newly launched website, which probably is very informative. And now, and um, uh, you can also look into uh, Open Embedded Wiki, or there are IRC channels as well, Yocto and OE uh, handles on free node. And um, mailing lists, if you're new, feel free to contribute uh, to um, Open Embedded or to any other uh, layers that are on top of Open Embedded um, for porting RISC-V. So I think um, I'm open for questions now. Thank you for listening patiently. Yes, sir. Okay, so I think uh, the question is uh, that you know people have um, why is five, right? So I think the um, um, if you look at software, right, in past twenty years um, or more how it has become so prevalent. So today, you are talking continuous delivery, continuous integration, you know, you commit the code and you want to see it in next hour deployed, right? There are projects like that. So it has achieved that level by becoming mature, not, and all this actually involves a lot of open source software that goes underneath it, right? So what RISC-5 is trying to do is it's trying to give you an uh, an open ISA, if you are a hardware developer, you are developing some IP, um, and, and then tools um, that you can then build on top of it. So you are, you are not licensing, there are no needs for that. You can pick the ISA, add your IP on top, and then build a custom chip, right? On top of that, the tooling that's being added, that is actually very powerful where you can um, design a custom chip in a very fast time, turnaround time. So in this you know, IoT world where all applications will be different, I believe that you can't solve everything in software. You shouldn't, right? Many of those are, you might want to have custom hardware doing specific things. If you can have an infrastructure that can let you make a system within the costs, a hardware systems. I'm sure you would do it. Similarly with software, what you're doing with software, your cost of you know, re-spinning and, and changing are, are lower. So this five, it could be something else, right? Uh, as long as it is an open ISA. So RISC-V happens to be an open ISA, right? So that is why it is being picked right now. So it's not that it has anything specific. Obviously, it has features that you, you want to have uh, that were lacking in the you know, other open architectures. It's not the first one. As I mentioned, open risk is there, right? That was already available. But it's missing certain pieces, like um, you know, IEEE 758 implementation is not there, right? Uh, so there are uh, the compressed instruction sets are not there. So, so they, they, uh, what it is trying to do is provide you a, a modern architecture in a more with open source ISA. So anybody who is trying to invent or innovate on top of using hardware IP, they have a little easier for them. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah, follow on question to that. If I add custom instructions to my specific risk five implementation, because I can, right? Um, I need that supported by tooling as well, like in compiler and LLVM, fiber. What kind of challenges do you think that brings for open embedded or for Yocto to be able to allow people to support actually those kind of um, yeah, so I think the question is, if you customize, then what are the challenges of customization on software? 
Um, so I think uh, uh, there, it is challenging if you change ABI, for example, right? So, uh, and I'm, I'm encouraged by seeing RISC-V um, or, um, like foundation take this and define it, right? So they are adding definitions as to how the ABI should look like. And uh, the idea that we shouldn't be breaking ABI, you know, so basically having a system where, yes, you added more IP, but from software aspect, you may not want to add that as to your, you know, your, your basically your standard interface. You still might have extensions that you might want to add to compiler and things like that to take advantage of that. But it will not break your software, say if you are generating without your customizations, that software will still run on your system. But if you customized it and you, know, uh, you want to run that on uh, the older hardware or you know, the uh, non-customized hardware, that might not work. But if you recompile it, it might work. Thank you. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Right. So again, the, it's an extension to the question that um, previously we were discussing. Actually. Um, there are actually four uh, variants that are currently allowed, if you look in there, right? So in, in a sense, there are four ABIs. If you consider map it to MIPS, there were much more, right? So um, the four ABIs are pretty much set uh, in the tools and also in the kernel. So as long as you remain within the bounds of those four ABIs, right, um, that is the intention to go forward, right? And any extensions you might have are extensions on top of those they should not be breaking the existing ABIs that are in there. So how you add those um, support into your tools, for example, you know, you are not going to submit a patch into GCC saying that, okay, let's change Vectorizer to use my fancy extension. That's, not, that's, where, that's what I'm meaning here, that the fundamental instruction set still remains same that the compiler uses to generate the code. You might have uh, additional instructions that you want to use um, for those specific um, extended profiles. But fundamentally, if you were to build for, say, QMU RISC-V, you can take that same binary and run it on your custom chip, and it will work. Right? So you are able to reuse a lot of source code when you are customizing. A uh, lot of the programs that are already available to you are, are reusable from that sense. So it's more of a you're building on top rather than not forking on the side and changing the compatibility. So you should just be able to apply patches to those specific tools for your instruction and add the dependency or other... Yes, yes, correct. So I think I mean, you should basically um, be able to... Um, I mean, there will be M tunes and all those things, you know, so you want to take advantage of instruction sets. So GCC will have pipelines and all those optimizations, which actually currently don't exist as much. So you could choose those, uh, depending upon what is your fundamental microarchitecture that you are customizing on top of. So, um, so I hope that, that um, you know, whether, if you ask me whether you can fork it, yes, you are allowed to, right? So nobody is stopping you from doing that, but that is not the intention um, to, to uh, so the fundamental support that went into Linux, for example, defines the Linux ABI now, right? So that's your contract for future. There are no new additions that are going to come without you know, being discussed in the community and being agreed upon, right? So um, 
wasn't the case with MIPS, right? For example, people submitted their own ports and they did all bunch of stuff in there. Yeah. Yes. Yes. I think that's that's a great idea. I mean, the thing is, um, as as I'm saying here, you know, there aren't very many variants available for that to um, kind of cause a pain right now, but something of that order is probably on the cards, right? When somebody comes up with a real chip that kind of have um, wide acceptance and has few additional things that you want to consider, and then you have an array of machines to support and all those tools, you probably might have these plugins or extensions that plug in into those tools. So uh, it's, it's pretty much on the cards at that point. Yes? Does, does RISC V have the, uh, the meltdowns of executive code? <laughs> I can't speak to that because, you know, I don't work for a company that implements it. So even if they have, I would not know. Yeah, I am an open source developer. Yes. Uh, so regarding the full loader, uh, so is Berkeley full loader designed for Risk Five, or is it, I mean, is it the only one that's going to work with it, or do you put like you know you would work in a similar fashion, right? So right. Right. Yeah. So I think the question is whether uh, BBL is the only bootloader, or you know, so. Uh, BBL is one of the bootloaders right now. So it is used to bootstrap, actually, FPGA and things like that. But uh, there is work happening on UFI and uh, work happening on U-Boot. And actually, you know, you're welcome to contribute to U-Boot a lot. So there's a hackathon going on. And I think, uh, you know, if you step up there, uh, you know, they would be happy to kind of brief you on what they are doing in terms of bootloaders. But certainly, it's not tied to those bootloaders. Those are just ones that are available. The reason for that is that there is a spike simulator framework from Berkeley that was used before the you know, QMU and all this came along. And the way to bootstrap uh, the system was you know, using BBL. So that's just, yeah. So more questions? Yeah, so I think um, there is a talk whether uh, this will be taken up by Race 5 Foundation. Okay. So they might maintain it. Um, don't know yet. I think it remains to be seen, hopefully, that you know, it will find a different place. Uh, it's just seated there right now. Uh, eventually, the um, idea is that, you know, as I talked about making it first-class architecture in Open Embedded, we might not need it uh, per se. You know? It might just be supported out of box. So, but yeah, good question. So, um, uh, more questions, comments? Okay. So, I hope you enjoyed the talk and, uh, you know, you go home and uh, check out. And, uh, you know, I'm expecting patches from you on my GitHub handle. Thank you very much.